Welcome to Cloudy Gothenburg and the Volvo Group Capital Markets Day 2022. It is great to be back again. It is 18 months since last time and what a period it has been. The world has been faced with more than one crisis, but with at least the pandemic improving, it is great to be able to welcome a live audience again. So a special welcome to all of you joining us in our studio here in Gothenburg, and also, of course, a welcome to all of you watching online. The last period has truly been challenging, but we within the Volvo Group, we have been able to ride the storm and also make considerable progress. We are in a strong position and we are geared for growth. And we think it is time to start to view our industry differently. Because if you think about it, decarbonizing our customers' businesses will provide us with remarkable business opportunities. Opportunities that will allow us at Volvo to make a real step change. So with growth as our main topic today, let me welcome Martin. Thank you, Kina. Uh, and also from my side, it's uh, great to see all of you here in Gothenburg today. It has been a while since we have had different type of audiences uh, back at the headquarters, but uh, now we have been able to welcome customers and suppliers and other partners, and now also all uh, our friends from uh, the different uh, uh, areas of the capital market. So, so great to see you. But of course, great to, uh, also from my side to see everyone on the web here. And as you were alluded to, uh, Kina, it has been since we actually met in uh, November 2020, uh, then virtually, of course, a very specific period. I think that we, at that time, even if we were eight, nine months into the pandemic, uh, could not understand all the different challenges that still should prevail. I mean, it has been two and a half years now of I should say, unprecedented global challenges. And despite that, uh, I'm very proud to stand here to say that the group has continued to uh, grow, uh, to show strength and resilience, and, and also to uh, perform uh, when it comes to the uh, financial metrics. Uh, but what is really positive in this turmoil is, despite this, the journey of decarbonization and sustainable solutions in different sectors are not only continuing, but as a matter of fact, uh, partly also related to this accelerating. So, um, as we say in Sweden, um, this is the time when the wheat is separated from the chef. Or to be more international, maybe when uh, the strong and the best are separated from the rest. So, uh, welcome to the Capital Markets Day 2022 for the Volvo Group. Uh, we are geared for growth. Thank you, Martin. Let's get this show on the road and join our colleagues by the table. Absolutely. So, hello, colleagues, uh, Tina and Jan, and maybe, Tina, a special welcome to you. You are, a, of course, a familiar face to us, but maybe new for, for some in the audience. Uh, Martin, we said it has been a tough period globally, mm. but we are in a, in a good shape. What has enabled us to get to this point? Now, I mean, uh, we always talk about it, but, but for me, it's uh, very clear that it's all about people, it's all about colleagues. Uh, we have seen, uh, I mean, the relentless work that has been done now over the last, uh, as I said, two and a half years, of course, before that as well. But uh, this period has been very special to us, uh, both, I mean, just keeping the right priorities when it comes to health and safety, when it comes to customer focus, and still also having the uh, eyes on the ball when it comes to uh, actually continuing to have uh, strong resilience. Uh, but it goes not only for our colleagues, it goes for all the partners. We feel that we have strengthened the relation with customers and suppliers. And uh, for me, it's coming back to how we are working together as a company, our values, uh, our operating model. I'm a strong believer in a decentralized organization. Uh, where the PL, uh, the profit and loss responsibility, the balance sheet responsibility uh, is very close to where the magic is happening. Uh, we have seen that that is working in this type of uh, environment when you need to take a lot of different type of decisions uh, quickly. Um, uh, and you can summarize that uh, decentralization uh, because I often get the question, what does that really mean? And I say that we are operating with two principles, basically, in, the, in this company. That uh, The principle number one is that every business area 
every region market area. Uh, they are uh, responsible for their customer satisfaction, their growth uh, and their profitability. And principle number two, they can utilize whatever they like uh, in the Volvo Group to improve number one. Uh, it's more, not more difficult than that, because then you're creating pull instead of push, that we are sitting here at the headquarters and telling everyone what they should do. And that is what we see now, speed, agility, uh, but also this uh, can-do mindset mm. that is really uh, in, in the DNA, I, I feel, of the organization. And you will hear more about it today. Uh, indeed. And, and Tina, among the four of us, you're actually the one who has been <laughs> the longest with the company, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, your view on the cultural change? Yes, I have actually seen this company for quite a few years, 24 years, to be honest. Uh, when Impressive. We calculation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think as a company, we are much more aligned than what we used to be. We are also stronger on owner's mentality, which for me as a CFO is great because it means that we are more disciplined in cost and, and price management, but also in capital allocations. But it is not only about the financials, it is also about the people. Uh, and I think everyone in here knows that uh, a company with stronger earnings and with financial stability more easily attracts the right talents and the people that we really need. Absolutely. And Jan, our strategy still holds as well? Yeah, I think so. I think we, when we go back to 2015, we all remember when we set the strategic, strategic framework with a pyramid with the seven strategic priorities. And I think, uh, I think the strategy has served us very well, actually. We did uh, in uh, 2020 an update. We call it internally the Vision 2030. We were looking a little bit ahead. We saw that maybe clearer than 2015 that the transformation was coming, actually. Uh, an update, but also we kept the consistency as well. So you will recognize a lot of the things are the same, the base is the same, but more focus on, on the transformation. And I, I think if you look upon it, transform to become a leading end-to-end -end transport integrator, one typical area I would say, uh, that is emphasized more than before. When we look into the end-to-end -end transport solutions, uh, it's extremely important, obviously. When we talk about the product portfolio, service portfolio, desirable and sustainable as well. And then obviously what we have talked about for quite some time, how we continue to focus on services and solutions as well. And I think you will see a lot of examples of that uh, during, the, during the day. Mm. But it's interesting to see also, I mean, the pyramid, we discussed that uh, during the update, should we change anything? But I mean, I have to say that it's, uh, uh, it's very, well balanced actually, a clear mission driving prosperity uh, and I love the word prosperity uh, through transport and infrastructure solutions and all the way down to our values and our way of conducting business. I think that is holding together in a, in a smart way and, and putting the, the framework without putting the limit, so to speak. Mm. And, and Jan, would you say that it is our strategy that has enabled us to deliver on our financial ambitions? Absolutely. I think what we recognized uh, quite a few years ago was that we didn't have the, the profitability that a company li like this should have. We were in low single dig dig digit figures in terms of EBIT margin. We had a far too high volatility in our earnings, in our cash flows. And we also saw that there were room for improvements when it comes to the, um, to the uh, capital allocation as well. If we look upon it right now, I think we can say that when it comes to these three things, I think we can say honestly that we have actually ticked the boxes on these three. We also added on, uh, I think it was a year uh, after these three uh, circles, we also added on that we would continue to invest in business module innovation and new technologies as well. And as you can see here on the slide, it's actually so that we haven't ticked that one. Mm -hmm. And we will never tick that one firmly because it is always a question about being in constant motion. We need to develop all the time. But I think what we can say is that what we have talked about before, we are delivering. And I think you, once again, we'll see a lot of examples of that we are leading this transformation, actually. Mm. And Martin, we have deliberately left some space on mm. the right hand side. Maybe you would like to reveal what's going to come. No, I mean, first and foremost, I think uh, Jan alluded to it, when it comes to business models, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to new technologies, we are not doing that for the sake of doing it. Uh, we are doing it for satisfying the needs for our customers, their customers, and for the society at large. And what is happening now with the decarbonization journey is, of course, that the whole uh, innovation here is a great opportunity for us also to drive growth. Because the whole industry dynamics that is happening now with the electrification and with the autonomous type of solutions, etc., is driving growth in another dimension that we are used to and that we will come back to. 
Uh, and if something that you should uh, maybe remember during these uh, couple of hours is that we are moving more and more from a unit count to a content count. Uh, since also the diverse type of product portfolio is uh, making it difficult to have a unit count. So uh, great excitement about these opportunities ahead now. And, and we wanted also to have this consistency when we talk about the value creation journey for Volvo in terms of the uh, capital markets as well. Mm, so, so what we're saying is that the fifth ambition mm. is a consequence of the fourth, basically. Absolutely, they are linked uh, um, because the growth, of course, uh, will continue in the underlying demand and, and uh, company specific opportunities in the current business. We'll talk about that. But uh, the great step change here is, of course, the, the decarbonization mm. and uh, leaders lead. Mm. Uh, Jan, I, I would like to bring up an old favorite slide, uh, the magic one with the dots, uh, our product <laughs> portfolio. Uh, how does our approach to product portfolio management benefit us going forward? Uh, I think f first and foremost, uh, I know that you out in the audience now and uh, many of you on the, on the web, you are still wondering which one are the red ones. <laughs> and I will not tell you which ones they are actually. Because if we go back some years when we started this discussion, which ones the, the red ones are, they have changed over time <laughs> and they change over time as well. Many of the red ones, they have turned into yellow, into green, and some of them actually turned into dark green as well. So this is a methodology that we work with. I think we have some very, very good examples of, of activities where we have improved quite a bit. Uh, we have UD trucks, a fantastic turnaround that has been made, that also then formed a basis for our alliance with Isuzu, and also then a, a obviously a good transaction end of the day of UD. I think to lift another thing, uh, two other things in, in, in the uh, truck business is actually when it comes to medium duty trucks, both in Europe and in Brazil as well for Volvo trucks, has actually moved up uh, quite a bit on this, on this uh, ladder. But what we need to do now going forward is ob obviously we need to continue. We are not done. We have some actually assets that are still not performing in the way they should do that are still red. Uh, we need obviously to take care of that. And when we are in this transformation, it is maybe even more important than what it was before, because with all the things that we need to do going forward, the assets that we need to allocate going forward into the transformation, we need maybe to be even stricter actually when it comes to call it the low performing assets actually. Mm -hmm. So we are shifting the bar upwards. So something that was maybe yellow one year ago, maybe suddenly turned red even though the performance is not getting worse. So I think this with capital allocation going forward is quite important. But the model in itself serves us very well. Mm. And I mean, that's the beauty also with crystallizing uh, the different type of uh, performance through decentralization. So I mean, uh, otherwise the risk in a, in a big group is that everyone is hiding behind everyone. Mm. Here it's clear and it's good for everyone also because then we can actually take the right uh, actions. Mm. And Tina, we of course have external factors that mm. we need take to take in con into consideration. Inflation, geopolitical turmoil, we had the pandemic recently. Uh, how will our ways of working be beneficial for us if you look at both sort of the long term and the short term perspective? Yeah, we have worked really, really hard to, to uh, increase our performance over time. And if we look at the numbers, we do have structurally higher margins now. And we also have uh, lower volatility or less volatility than what has been the case before. But just coming back to your question, Kina, then, uh, and I think we can use the year 2020 as an example. 2020, we had COVID. We basically closed down the whole operation for six weeks, but we did reasonably well. And for me, it's also satisfying to conclude that we did not even have one single month in red numbers year 2020, not even the second quarter. Uh, so I think 2020 serves as a good proof point to really conclude that we have improved the flexibility in the operation significantly over time. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. We have a strong net cash position and we have also continued to shift out to our shareholders. And now I'm going to ask you a question that I believe you probably get quite often these days. Uh, what is your thinking regarding our famous cash position? Well, I think it goes without saying to say that uh, it is a strength for any kind of company to have a strong balance sheet and so for us. And particularly so standing in front of the transformation, which is the biggest change journey that this company has ever seen. But a strong balance sheet also is comforting when you enter into something like COVID and uh, uh, also the situation that we now have in, in Russia uh, or the inflationary pressure for that matter. A strong balance sheet gives us as management 
the maneuverability to really balance between different interests and take the right decisions for the company also in tough times. So it's a, it's a very good strength for us as management. If we look a little bit back and look into the numbers, we can see that we have had a strong cash generation, not only in the strong years, but also in the more difficult times. If we look a little bit ahead, uh, it is a strength for us to have a strong balance sheet because it will help us to both invest for the future, but also to return a lot of money to our shareholders. We have actually returned more than 100 billion uh, over the last five years to our shareholders, and we have still kept a strong balance sheet. Mm, that is a pr pretty impressive number, Martin. Yeah, and, and I mean, you should remember also, I think uh, everyone that is sitting here is, of course, well aware of that, but also the net cash position is actually belonging to the shareholders. So it's uh, also a situation depending on where are you keeping, so to speak, the funds. When with the capital return on capital employed over 25% in this situation, I think also we have been showing that we have been uh, good in actually uh, generating good returns for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, uh, of course, uh, if we should have been having a normal going concern in the world uh, with the current financial target, you can argue should it be in, on this uh, uh, side. But I think also if you take a step back uh, now, uh, two and a half uh, years uh, with an unprecedented term, more or less we have talked about, uh, an upcoming um, transformation uh, and also a changing landscape into the normal again with interest rates and with uh, funding costs that will be uh, as it should be. That has not been an exception, as that has been an exception over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I think that balance will be, of course, reconsidered big time when it comes to uh, how you think about value for your investments and as an investor. Mm. Uh, Martin, one of the key elements of our growth journey is services. It's super important for our resilience. What is your view on our development? First and foremost, favorite subject uh, for <laughs> different reasons. Uh, the first reason is because uh, the better we do in our service business, uh, the higher customer retention, customer loyalty and customer touch point uh, we have. Uh, when I talk to Roger and Bruno and Marty, uh, they are always talking about that, Melker, etc. How do we continue to drive this? Because it's all about the customer. Then on top of that, as cream of the pudding, it's really also, of course, the resilience. Uh, that ability to, to actually uh, leverage the installed fleet in a smart way. And as you can see here, we've had a good development. Uh, KGAR of 5% over the last, uh, uh, since 2017, despite then uh, all the turmoils that we've discussed. And still an untapped potential. Of course, the base is the installed fleet, as you can see on the right side. But when we look now granular for our different type of services, we have done great improvements but still an untapped potential, both when it comes to duration and when it comes to content. And the contract business is one of the key areas because that is driving parts, it is driving workshop hours, it is driving productivity services, etc., etc. So uh, more to come. More to come. And, and as we said, a topic that we discuss a lot within the company. Uh, Tina and Jan, uh, thank you for now. We will see you both later. Now we're going to widen the perspective and look at how the move towards a fossil-free society gives us great business opportunities. Stay put. <laughs> So we are moving towards a more sustainable society and here our industry is playing a crucial role. And as you remember during our last Capital Markets Day, we presented our ambitions and our plans. And Martin, I would like to revisit them and also take a sort of a fresh perspective mm. on how this area is developing. Mm. Now, but first and foremost, uh, we actually took the step into uh, the new long-term ambition for the group in 2020, talking about what we call the three times 100%. Uh, and the reason for that is to have a clear direction also where the group is heading when it comes to a truly sustainable transport and infrastructure system. 100% safe because that is deeply embedded in our DNA. Uh, if you think about, if you close your eyes and think about Volvo, you think about safety, you think about this type of really uh, high level of, of durability. Uh, and that is more than important than ever. Actually, 1.3 million people dies every year in terms of uh, 
traffic accident, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, and uh, of course, a focus area uh, when it comes to the long-term uh, United Nations global targets. Uh, but also in other areas that we are serving, we see that health and safety is coming up rightly so high on the agenda. 100% fossil free, that is the whole decarbonization journey that we will continue to talk. I mean, in order to drive, uh, I mean, the increased need of transport, they need to be considerably more sustainable. And last, 100% more productive. Why is that important? Yes, because we see in the operations of our customers fantastic opportunities of improvement and utilize the resources in a better way. It's everything from circularity, but it's also about filling rates, it's about utilizing the digital capabilities of our connected units to cope with the planet planetary boundaries and at the same time embrace growth. And that is the equation. So we like this, it's simple, it's straightforward, but it's very, very uh, clear uh, what the ambition and the direction is for, for the group. Mm. And we also have a reminder from last CMD. Yes. And uh, we left you actually in November 2020 with this slide. It looks pretty busy, but uh, a lot of things have actually been confirmed uh, since. Um, we talked about an opportunity of a century, uh, and we talked about a number of keywords here that we will actually see if that was only talk or if uh, things have actually been evolving and executed accordingly. We talked about the growth opportunity and we talked about the resilience opportunity with a shift into decarbonized and, and um, sustainable transportation. Maybe a number of highlights. Uh, we had uh, the thesis of um, an uptick when it comes to the revenue over the life cycle for electric and electromobility that is approximately or at least 1.5x uh, in relation to a diesel and up to 5x or even more than 5x than for autonomous, two data points. Uh, we said also that at least 35% of our uh, sales in 2030 should be electric, either fuel cell or battery electric. And also saying that this in turn will also give new opportunities when it comes to services and when it comes to the service content of our total revenues. So um, I think that was, can serve as a good starting point for today's sessions also when we listen into the business area precedents later. Mm. And Martin, on the topic of sustainability and transformation, I would like to put you to a test early on in the show. I brought two numbers. Do you know what they represent? Uh, I actually do know what they represent, the Kina. Surprise. Uh, uh, so so uh, <laughs> uh, pure luck, pure luck. Uh, but they actually represent um, companies that has been approved by the science-based target initiatives for two different years. So in 2015, it was uh, uh, 116 companies, and year to date now, 2022, that has increased up to 3,170, so a very steep increase here. And um, uh, maybe you, you put your question to yourself, why is this significant? And we will soon come back to that, but maybe what will happen in the future here? Well, what's interesting is if you extrapolate this graph with the same current growth rate, this graph is completely skyrocketing into the roof, which provides us with a great business opportunity. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the market and the whole transformation is unfolding in front of our eyes here. And the reason for that is that if you take a one-minute crash course in science-based targets, what is that all about? That is that companies are actually uh, making a clear commitment to the link between their own operations and their own business and the Paris Agreement. Either the more ambitious 1.5 degree target or the other target of maximum 2 degrees warming, right? And how is that process working? That is working in the following, that you are actually doing a mapping of your CO2 footprint, and um, then you are dividing that into different categories. Uh, you can say in a matrix, uh, one category is scope one, scope two, scope three, where scope one is the CO2 uh, footprint from your own operations, scope two is the bought energy for your operations, or value chains, and, or operations, I should say, and scope three is actually uh, the input material as well as your products and services in use uh, at your customers or customers' customers' uh, operations. The other part of the matrix is also that you do this uh, mapping when it comes to different categories of your operations. It could be uh, heating, it could be building, it could be logistics, it could be input material, it could be product in use, etc. And what is happening is that 
something is playing out now when it comes to the ecosystem. Because what is my scope three or our scope three could be some else's scope one and scope two. So suddenly people and companies really need to start cooperating at a different level. Just to give one example, and here is a global OEM in automotive. It could have been a retail company for clothing or for uh, dairies or whatever. It doesn't matter. As I said, first and foremost, it is a categorizing of different categories uh, building up to the 100% CO2 footprint. So here, for example, you have a category that is uh, representing uh, a very big part of the total 100% because it's going from here to here. And so that is the x-axis, right? And on the y-axis, it is the abatement cost or benefits uh, for taking out this. So then a uh, friend of order can ask uh, themselves, why has not that been done? For example, here it looks like a great opportunity. You can take out like 5%. And save money. Yeah, because um, to take out the waste, you have to see the waste. Uh, and which is, by the way, maybe the most important principle when it comes to lean. Uh, that is often forgotten in the lean uh, training programs, by the way. But uh, so, so what can that be? That can be, for example, filling rates in logistics. That you have today a filling rate that is 60% of your inbound transport as a company. But if you can increase that to 70 or 75%, it is a saving both for CO2 and for cost, right? And then you have the more hardcore and hard to abate than uh, sectors that we are all aware of. A lot of progress happening there often, but it's coming with the premium cost then so far. Cement, it could be steel, aluminium, whatever. The good news, if you take a customer customer, because this uh, short is representing a customer customer. It's not our direct uh, transport customers, but their customers in turn. When they are doing this inventory and mapping, they realize often one thing that, number one, logistics and transport are representing a big proportion on the x-axis here of their CO2 footprint. But they also realize when they start to look through this, that the cost, the total cost of taking it out, is in relative terms rather low. And with a science-based target dynamic, where you are, one, doing the mapping, two, setting the targets, three, starting to execute, and four, now the magic is happening, you start to disclose your progress. In the boardroom and in the management room, you're starting to get you know, a little bit nervous after a couple of years if you're not seeing progress here. And that is a fantastic opportunity for us and for the sector to really drive uh, the shift into uh, electromobility. So uh, if we go to the next slide here and, and talk about how will this happen then for our direct customers, the transporters, to simplify it, and we will go a little bit more in detail, three parameters must happen for them, for our uh, customers directly then to support then, uh, the examples that we did see. They need to understand the revenue and TCO, the total cost of operation impact. And it's both a revenue impact because in many cases you can get better paid with the CO2 functionality. They need to understand the CO2 savings. And one thing that we have realized now when we are ramping up when it comes to orders and deliveries, they need also to have the confidence and the ease of implementation and operation. And that has been seen in many cases as a bigger hurdle than previously expected. And that's the reason why we are setting up that support and partnership in new ways now, so, so they feel confident that we will support them over time. If we take uh, it to the next level, um, we talked about uh, this last time we met. Then it was based on the ICE uh, total cost of operation, based on years of experience. Uh, we knew everything about how the cost uh, distribution is made, etc. Uh, but we had certain theories of how it should play out for a battery electric vehicle. What we basically said that is the vehicle with our replication excellence, um, the service and repair piece, the financing and insurance are staying the same, basically. But what is happening is that the, the light gray part here, that is the cost of energy, diesel is going down and it's shifted to electricity and you are pushing in a battery here. So what we need to provide is also the battery and charging system. The whole trick of the ease and confidence of implementation and operation is to get the desired outcome for the customers. 
And you cannot miss one single piece. We are B2B. We are selling production equipment, and we are selling promises together with our customers of uptime, cost per kilometer, CO2-free, safety, productivity, and eventually peace of mind. So, in order to drive this, we have invested heavily and focused in the battery and charging systems, but also on how we are actually approaching our customers in a very uh, consistent way to make the journey together. Let me take two examples on what is happening, uh, where we have been working. Uh, the first, real cases. We have done plenty of cases here. And this is maybe the essence of the whole transformation that we're going through now in the coming five, six minutes here. This is, a, of course, a real case, a France urban distribution. Uh, you see the um, ICE, the internal combustion engine, uh, situation for this transport company. Unaffected cost because rather low mileage, right? Uh, in terms of driver, administration, etc., is 75% of the operational cost of the company. Then when it comes to the truck TCO, the truck total cost of operation, uh, you see that fuel is representing 7.4, leasing 11.4, and you have other than services and insurance also exactly. When you are shifting into battery electric with a current price point, of course, capex for the customer is increasing, and thereby leasing cost is going up to 19.4, whereas the cost of energy is decreasing dramatically. So two learnings here, uh, first, or three learnings. First and foremost, the total cost of operation for the customer. So, so the necessary price increase is uh, then 5.5 percentage points in turn, or a little bit more if you have a margin, hopefully as well, uh, towards uh, the customer, uh, the retailer or the OEM or to the Volvo if we are buying transport, which we do. 5.5%, okay? Have that in mind. Number two, uh, we'll come to the next slide here in a summary. Here you see again the TCU of the truck, 25%. So far, the TCU of the truck in itself up with 22.3%, but the change in total cost for the transport company, 5.5%. And two learnings. Every extra kilometer uh, for this very truck to drive efficiency with digital services and others is actually 57% lower in relation to the ICE. And the reason is simple, you have the capex, you have a much lower variable cost, right? So this will continue to drive also the utilization. As we actually did see in factories and in operations when you started to automate. Because when you started to automate, you started to think about, okay, should I do two, three, uh, three shifts, four shifts, five shifts, etc. Because you would like to utilize your capital. The other thing here is that the CO2 cost, uh, uh, abatement cost is still rather high, right? Uh, 300 euros uh, per ton. But since the cost here is only 5.5%, I would like, and I cannot um, uh, avoid it, come back to my uh, milk example. Uh, you remember that we talked about what will the impact be on the cost of the milk for the customers' customers. And if we go to our previous thesis, we said actually it should be uh, a 1% a, a impact. But we were pessimistic. Uh, the reality is that uh, the, the impact is uh, less than so. It's uh, a 0.5% impact with this 5.5%. And the mathematics behind that is simple. In a cost increase of 5.5%, as we did see on previous slide, and then multiply the cost of logistics for, for example, a retailer that is selling milk that is somewhere between, yeah, let's say, 6 and 8%. So take 8% times 5% uh, increase is 0.4%, right? So this is what will happen. The good news is that often for a retailer, the logistics CO2 footprint, the scoop 3, is very high, could be up to 30, 35%. So for this type of uh, price premium for their products to take away and to adhere to the science-based target is what I should call a no-brainer. Next example, uh, a little bit other angle on it. This is a regional hall customer in Sweden this time. Uh, you see that the unaffected cost here is 60%. Fuel higher, higher mileage, so 18%. Leasing. 15%, but significant higher fuel because much, much higher utilization of the fleet. With 
the shift into uh, battery electric uh, leasing is going up, again higher capex with the batteries, while electricity or the cost of energy going down. And if we do the summary of this example, you see the same logic. Uh, the 3.7% uh, uh, increase of cost of operation, but if you go to the next slide, you can see, again, in summary, that the truck total cost of operation was 40% of the total cost for the company. The change in the truck TCU up with 9.3% in this case. And the change in total cost for the transport company up with 4%. The cost per extra kilometers is significant also here in Regional Hall. 40% per extra saved, uh, per uh, uh, extra kilometer is fantastic. And we know that here is a big room for improvement by utilizing, as we said, a lot of the connected and productivity services as one example, better planning. But take a look at this. Here, the cost of reducing one ton of CO2 is 85 euros per ton, right? And that is also related then that you're utilizing the equipment much higher. And it's coinciding with the publicly trading prices today in Europe. Here you see the European carbon permits uh, pricing that is publicly traded, that is around 85 euros. So that is the publicly trading prices. Interesting enough, more and more corporations are utilizing this, but often multiplied with a factor X, two or three, to take their investment decisions for the future, to get the right angle. And to have this type of knowledge together with the customers will, of course, drive the shift here. And maybe one last single clue on it that we all know from an in investment profile perspective. If we look at uh, different sectors and uh, how it looks for companies, we can see also that the leaders in decarbonization also enjoys higher uh, growth and thereby eventually higher valuation. If you look at uh, sectors like uh, chemicals, food, auto uh, auto uh, automotive, etc., you see that it has been a uh, considerably higher growth over the last years now for the leaders in decarbonization. And that is, of course, a trend that will only continue. And that is the reason why we also focus to continue to lead the shift in this transformation. And maybe, Kina, why don't we listen to one of our key partners in to this journey? We are going to do so, but first just a comment from my end, Martin. I mean, we have obviously seen this presentation now many times. But it is really an eye-opener, and we see that market really growing in front of our eyes. So thank you so much. We're going to go to uh, the Danish logistics solution provider, Mersch, who is a long-time partner of ours. They have high ambitions when it comes to uh, eliminate emissions in line with the Paris Agreement and their set science-based target. And to do so, they turn to the Volvo Group. Uh, I gave it up ja, kraantje 51, 74 gaan we beginnen. Over the last six years, we have actually been on a road to transform from being a quite diversified conglomerate, but with a lot of shipping interests, into uh, what will eventually be a global logistics uh, company. And our aim is to become the global integrator of container logistics, offering our customers truly end-to-end -end solutions, door-to-door -door solutions. And with this leading position that you have in the industry, what are your goals when it comes to decarbonizing the transport system? This year have advanced our carbon neutrality date to 2040. And Probably more importantly, we've set some pretty, I think, ambitious uh, targets for 2030 in terms of where we want to be with, with, with that decarbonization. We are seeing uh, customer support. We are seeing a good understanding of the technical uh, pathway. And, and if you look at the partnership between Mask and the Volvo Group, how do you see that partnership? And what expectations do you have on Volvo in supporting you on this journey? Well, we have quite a unique uh, relationship with Volvo because Volvo is one of our largest customers. But we are also a customer of, uh, of Volvo, and we certainly look to, to, to Volvo to, to help us or by, by providing solutions for how to tackle, in particular, uh, mobility, trucking, uh, onshore, on uh, so that we can find uh, you know, green solutions uh, to, that we can offer to, to our customers. I think Martin Lundstedt have said it very well. Uh, leaders lead together, and that's what we're aiming to do 
uh, with Volvo when it comes to inland transportation. We are on the way already. We have uh, ordered, I believe, around 125 electric trucks uh, so far uh, in, in the US from Volvo. We need thousands. Uh, and, and we're starting to learn how to operate uh, electric trucks uh, in, 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 the, in the right way. And that will be a focus for us in the coming decade. So, Saran there, the CEO of Maersk, what yeah. is your take listening to him? Now, first and foremost, I think what we see about Maersk being a leader in their sector, how ambitious targets. I had the chance to participate at their global summit a couple of weeks ago. That actually was total here in Gothenburg, but that was a pride. I mean, we should not forget that Maersk, as a global leader, that they have direct calls to, to Gothenburg is very important for the whole Nordic region. So just show how important and logistics are, but they have very, very clear ambitions. And Søren, as the CEO, has pointed out that together with the whole team that decarbonization is key. And um, they are also a great example of what is happening when it comes to the transformation. We have talked about these uh, famous S-curves that uh, average is, uh, is uh, the, the sum of nothing at the end of the day. Uh, but, but you need to understand granularly what is happening. And last time we talked about that in certain regions, segments and applications will start this transformation uh, first. And when they are coming into this transformation, I mean, it could be distribution in the Nordic region, or it could be waste collection in certain big cities, or it can be as we did see with Maersk here, uh, I mean, that they are looking through their different hubs and container terminals and saying, okay, in this and this hub we will start. And then the shift is coming very quick. And then finally it's adding up to some sort of average here. But the trick is that you need to have the abilities to meet this flexible demand with speed, agility. And what we have learned also is that we will not only lead and follow these S-curves, we will actually create them with customers. And to get to that understanding is bringing so much energy and excitement uh, amongst our teams that we uh, are not only leading, we are actually creating the future. That is just a fantastic moment. And that brings us to, uh, I mean, something that is very important for our industry. That is the very close customer relations that we have. We are B2B, and I often say that we are B2B with a heart. Uh, because, of course, the majority of the business decisions are taken on rational grounds. But a part of it is also based on a long-lasting trust uh, that we have built up together. And what will happen now with this shift is that uh, the already uh, deep relations will be even deeper, closer, broader. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, it will cover different areas. First and foremost, uh, don't make any mistake. I mean, the whole equipment area, the core of the core, will continue to develop. We talked about that, electrification, autonomous, uh, but also when it comes to infrastructure and equipment. Then it's about the operational ecosystem and the productivity services. And as I've already alluded to, we see great potential when it comes to growth per unit over the life cycle. But we also see the whole service uh, 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 and finance penetration uh, opportunity unfolding uh, big time here. What is important is, of course, also to understand where to play and where to win. And we are very clear about that also with our must wins, uh, where we are investing, where we are taking the lead, but also where we need to have strong partnerships with the best. Because that is the only way. No one can do it to zero, both with our customers and supply partners. But if we do it together, we will win. So this is also an exciting journey that is taking place now. And uh, again, I think we will listen to uh, some exciting partnerships uh, moving forward during this Capital Markets Day. Mm, that's true, Martin. Um, to win the game, you obviously need an innovative organization mm. and you need money to spend. But how much value would you put on our customer relationship that has been running for decades now? Uh, but interesting, we have discussed that, and I will come back to it a little bit later, is that, uh, I mean, uh, the balance sheet uh, is an important financial type of metric. But the problem with the balance sheet is that it's just covering a rather small part of the real value of a company today. And customer relations is one example. Uh, modularity could be one, innovations, uh, speed, agility, etc. So uh, that's the reason I, I think that uh, one of the key aspects of having a capital market day is also for all of our investors, uh, our analysts to get a grip on how do we actually paint the picture around the balance sheet. And the customer relations is a key aspect for the transformation.
Mm. Thank you so much, Martin. We're going to move on and sort of dig deeper into the value of our customer relationships. And we're going to do so together with some of our colleagues from our business areas. <laughs> So, Roger, last time uh, we met during a Capital Markets Day, you did a very elegant entrance in an FMX electric. Welcome. Thank you, Kina. Yes, it was a really great entrance at that point of time. Good feeling. Really good feeling. And at that time, in fact, not many of our customers had tried the feeling of being behind the wheel in an electric truck. But that is different today. Yes, it is. And the feeling is actually better today because a lot of things has happened with the good speed as well. Now these trucks are ready to be ordered from production and the demand is really increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to dig deeper into the e-mob journey of Volvo trucks, mm. obviously, but could you say a few words first on your sort of overall performance? Yes, with pleasure, Kina. We at Volvo trucks, we have been growing our business in a very strong way, despite of the global supply chain situation. We have been taking market shares in the majority of the countries around the world. In Europe now, we are well above 19%. In North America, we are moving closer to the 12%. And in Brazil, we have 26% market share. And we have been doing this and driving price increases at the same time, and also then growing our service business. Mm -hmm. And I guess that means that you are now sort of in a good position to continue the transformation? Yes, we are. We are very strong into this one. And as you know, we started on the serial production of the medium duty electrical trucks three years ago. And then one year later, we came in North America as well. Today, we have our electrical trucks rolling into customer operations into 21 countries around the world. And I think that is very impressive. It started really with the transport bias, and then it was moved into the larger logistic companies, like Imask, as we heard here, DFDS. But now it's also coming into our traditional customers. And the really good thing is that customers is coming back and buying more electrical trucks. Mm. And I know that you love market shares, yes, Roger. Absolutely. Can you tell us about the market share for electric trucks? <laughs> no, we have a strong position then globally in the electrification segment. When we are leading the electrification segment here in terms of market share, and we have a higher market share into that segment. In Europe, we have around 35%, and in North America, 50%. And our clear ambition is, as this is a step changer, that we should have a higher market share in the electrification. Mm. And this beauty here. Uh, it's lovely, isn't it's it? It's wonderful. It's a Volvo FM electric. Yes, correct. Great with AR mark. Yes. Uh, it will soon be delivered to a customer, right? Yes, it will. We will start now serial production of free heavy duty electrical trucks, and we will start that after the summer. But we have already sold 1,000 units out of these three models. And we have been selling more than 2,200 units of electrical trucks since we started in 2020. Now we will have a product range of six electrical trucks to offer to our customers. And that is the widest offer in the industry. And then we will be able then to handle most of the transport needs for our customers. Mm, the widest range in the industry makes you proud. But let's be fair. Still, I mean, compared to, to diesel truck, volumes are quite small. What does it take to make that true big shift? Martin was into it before. Peace of mind. We need to work closely with our customers to help them into that transformation. We need to look into each customer's needs, how they're operating, what is the route that they're driving, to build this and optimizing their productivity and efficiency. And when it comes to financing, we will then offer different kind of business model, including equipment and service. And that will provide our customers with peace of mind. And what does it mean in terms of business opportunities? Now, of course, this means revenues for us, that we can gain out more revenues of the business, because we will offer them a smorgasbord of different service options. So gold service contract on, the, on electrical trucks is up with 70% compared to diesel. The average contract length is twice as long compared to diesel, just to mention one example. Mm. Roger, with the Paris Agreement in place, all trucks need to be fossil free by, by 2050. These are high ambitions. We have high ambitions mm. internally to reach this target. How will it happen? Now, of course, this is high ambition and we should have high ambition, as you said, but we have a clear roadmap to achieve them. 
In 2030, we say at Volvo Trucks that 50% of the volume that we sell should then be battery electric. That means around 75,000 trucks. In 2040, everything that we, all trucks that we sell, should then be fossil free. And in 2050, we should have replaced the completely rolling population with fossil free products. Mm -hmm. So we have a very strong position. We have the products, we have then the customer relations, we have the distribution network, and we have the competence to do this. Mm -hmm. And we will then support our customers into that transformation. Mm -hmm. And we have you in the driver's seat, which feels very comfortable. Thank you so much for describing uh, the, the progress. Uh, the development is, of course, also ongoing in our other truck business area. We're going to move over to Renault Trucks and to Emmanuel. You are the head of uh, electromobility within Renault. And I would like you to give the audience a bit of a deep dive uh, in how you support your customers and what that means in terms of business. Absolutely. Thank you, Kina. So our customers and their customers, they have taken some strong commitments to reduce their CO2 footprint. And they are now seeking for advice and for tangible support when it comes to reaching these targets. And we at Renault Trucks, based on our experience, we have decided to organize a structured approach in order to accompany them in their transition. And we are positioning Renault Trucks as their partner for decarbonization. And this approach is organized around four main steps. In the first steps, we develop and we understand the customer constraints and the challenges. But in the same time, we develop their awareness and the knowledge around the available technology options to decarbonize road freight, and this based on scientific facts. Moving into the second step, the second step is where we are doing the diagnostic. And the diagnostic, it starts with the fleet. Here, we make the full diagnostic and a detailed analysis of the fleet, and we provide to our customer a proposal on how to organize the transition plan over a three to five years period of time. And from it, we deduct the potential CO2 savings. And because charging infrastructure is very key in this journey, and because it requires anticipation, we here perform together with our partners the electric audit of the site, and we conclude some recommendations when it comes to the power upgrades, but also when it comes to the charging solutions and installations. Moving into the third step, the solution design. The solution design, it's often starting with a vehicle trial. And it is an important step because it is the way for us to engage all the stakeholders in the project and to get the buy-in from everyone including the drivers. The complete offer includes charging solution, financing solutions, 100% penetration with service contracts, but it also includes different operating models from standard leasing up to full rental solution, also called equipment as a service. And here, going into the details with our customers, enable us to offer to our customer the most efficient solutions contributing to their total cost of ownership while in the same time protecting their operations. Moving to the last step, the implementation and operation. We run the implementation as a project in order to secure that we will have the entire readiness of the full ecosystem when the trucks will be reaching the yard of the customer. And during the first week of operations, we organize a close monitoring of the fleet. We organize a frequent dialogue with the customer to collect feedback, but also to help him further improve the energy consumption and the driver acceptance. This new approach is really requiring anticipation, expertise, speed, and reactivity and proximity if we want to make sure that we deliver to our customer the expected financial, operational, and environmental performance. And to illustrate, I propose that we now listen to one of our customer, Faith Solution, Carlsberg Group, operating in Switzerland, the largest fleet of electric trucks in Europe. We were sure that the LKWs for our use will work. 
Und wir als Feldstädtchen und Karlsberg haben ambitionierte CO2-Ziele bis 2030. Wir sind der Meinung, dass LKWs einen großen Beitrag zur Dekarbonisierung unserer Logistik beitragen können. Und äh, wir hatten die Experimentierphase schon 2008 begonnen. Das heißt, in 2019, als wir die LKWs bestellt haben, waren wir uns sicher, dass sie für den Einsatz in der letzten Meile-Distribution mit einer Range bis 100 Kilometer äh, für uns funktionieren. Und deswegen sind wir den Schritt gegangen. Die Fahrzeuge werden extrem positiv von unseren Fahrern angenommen. Es sind tolle Arbeitsmittel. Sie gewöhnen sich auch daran, dass sie weitere Reichweiten damit fahren können. Am Anfang waren sie eher skeptisch, mittlerweile sind sie dort sehr positiv. Wir nutzen die Fahrzeuge in allen Regionen, in den städtischen, genauso wie in den ländlichen, in den Bergregionen. Und wenn wir damit bei unseren Kunden ankommen, ist das Feedback auch sehr positiv zu diesen Fahrzeugen. Also unser Einsatz hier wird sehr geschätzt, auch von unseren Kunden. Wir hatten eigentlich keine Überraschungen. Wir haben das Ganze ja vorher simuliert. Die Simulationen stimmen eigentlich eins zu eins mit der Realität übereinander. Auch der höhere Verbrauch im Winter war uns bekannt, war keine Überraschung, also das funktioniert. Was eine kleine Herausforderung noch ist, ist das ganze Thema Ladeinfrastruktur. Das haben wir unterschätzt, da steckt mehr dahinter. Aber auch hier sind wir froh, wirklich mit Renault Trucks einen Partner zu haben, der uns hier unterstützt und uns weiter begleitet auf dem Weg, unsere Flotten CO2-neutral zu machen. And this very structural, almost surgical approach is appreciated by our customers that we heard. What is the result of it, Manuel? Oh, the result is uh, quite uh, impressive. We are uh, taking some strong position and we are really accelerating. As end of May, our market share is 21% and we have already signed more than 1,000 orders and letter of intents. And I can say that uh, this new approach is really contributing and will contribute to our success. It will contribute to the success of our customer. And again, the very positive feedback we receive from the customer and the drivers is really encouraging us to continue in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for now, and, and good luck with your continuous <coughs> journey. Uh, as you pointed out, batteries and charging is critical success factors. And Joachim? There you are, why don't you join me? You are the head of Volvo Energy and you are in the midst of this development and I know that you and your team, you are working extremely hard to make all this happen for our customers. Uh, why don't you walk us through the progress? Thank you, Kina. It's uh, a pleasure to do so and I would say we are working very hard uh, in order to uh, make sure that we accelerate the required charging infrastructure build-up. It is so important, as we have heard both from Emmanuel and Roger, to create the peace of mind for the customer. And in order to create that peace of mind, several solutions are required. It's both for the home depot and overnight charging for the customer. It's while the customer is on the road and it's also at the destination and uh, opportunity charging. But let's take it uh, step by step. We start with the, with the home depot and overnight charging. Already today, we offer all heavy duty Renault truck and Volvo truck customers this beautiful 43 kilowatt AC charging. This uh, charger is connected, which means that both Volvo, tr Volvo truck and Renault truck services can monitor it online. And also, in the unlikely event there would be an issue, of course, our dealers are there to support and also we are centrally from our support services. But we don't expect that to happen too often, of course. No. No. And uh, in addition, this one is easy to install. It will be delivered to our customers before the truck is delivered, which means that it's plug and play from day one. And of course, with 43 kilowatt AC charging, it's one of the most powerful chargers on the market today when it comes to AC Home Depot. But of course, we're already working on the next generations, including powerful DC chargers as well. Now, if we move to on the road, and I took a, a national example here, Sweden as a country, we are, of course, striving to secure a holistic uh, network from the northern part of Sweden all the way to the southern part. We will have 44 charging locations in cooperation with our partner, Oko Kivota. 29 of those will be at Volvo truck dealer facilities, and the remaining 15 will be at Oko Kivota properties. And the idea here, of course, when it's on the road, is to secure that our customers get a powerful, quick charging so they can have their 45-minute stop 
and then move on. So we will secure that all of these locations has the most powerful charging available today, which is 350 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. And I believe you also have some good news about the charging infrastructure in Europe. I do, Kina. Uh, looking at the European situation, uh, or as late as last week, we got the EU approval unconditionally to move ahead with the intended joint venture that we're planning to set up together with Daimler and Trayton. And the ambition here, as we have communicated before, is for this joint venture to install and operate 1,700, at least 1,700 high performance chargers along the main road arteries in Europe, targeting heavy duty electric trucks, but also coaches. And we plan, Kina, to do that within five years from getting the final antitrust approvals. And of course, with the EU now weighing in as late as last week, there are only a few left to go. Mm. I hope to be able to have some good news going forward as well. You will get there, I'm mm. sure. Uh, part of your scope is also to ensure second, a second life for our batteries. What does that really mean? Uh, and what value does it create? Well, as you know, within the Volvo Group, we take a holistic and circular approach to electrification in general, and that also goes for the batteries. So whilst the batteries are on board our vehicles, we refer to that as first life. We will monitor them and optimize them, and Lars and other colleagues will come back to that later. But having done a great service for our vehicles, be it trucks or yellow machines or others, for a number of years, sooner or later the batteries will come out. And we are monitoring them. That means that we have the data for each of the battery having served each Volvo Group vehicle. And that means that we know when to take them out. And we also know what would be the best second life application for those batteries. And that means, of course, that we can select a route for each battery that creates a really long customer relation, maybe up to in another 10 years or so. And that in turn means that we can have a greater asset value coming out of that battery, which is a win for the planet, it's a win for our environment, it's a win for our customer, and it's also a win for the Volvo Group, of course. And if we take a step back and look at one of the main possibilities with Second Life batteries, it is a battery storage system. What can you sort of see if you look around the corner? <laughs> well, this chart tries to look along around the corner, and I would say there are two main messages coming out. The first one is that the market, the projected market, I should say, for battery energy storage really is a growing market. And we can see a very impressive forecasted compounded annual growth rate here of 34%. So this is a rapidly growing market on one hand. So that's one message. And the second message is that the reason it's growing so quickly is that these storage systems can be used in so many different kinds of applications. It can be industrial, it can be commercial, it can be residential, it's in a cell phone tower, it's helping to stabilize the, the grid, it's EV charging for cars. There are so many different kinds of applications. So the true beauty here, of course, is that we are leaning in to help to create this. And that's also why we last week announced the investment into a UK-based uh, Second uh, Life specialized storage uh, company uh, to further accelerate our efforts in this area. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Joachim. I know that you enjoy breaking new ground. Why don't you have a seat? Um, we have looked at uh, some parts of our growth strategy for trucks, but we also have, of course, other business areas. Uh, we're soon going to move out. I hope it is okay for you in the audience that I leave you for a moment. I'm going to step out and join Melke, who has brought one of his beautiful machines with him, as you can see uh, through the window. And uh, on my way out, um, we're going to listen to one of our customers. They are operating both trucks and construction equipment. And I think this will give you a further feel for the business opportunities lying ahead. So uh, decarbonisation within our business is uh, the same for uh, Volvo Group. Uh, we, we want to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 uh, in all of our operations. So production of cement, hauling materials to our customers, and extracting materials from our operation. Mm. 
we have been working together with Volvo in reducing our emissions of our fleet. We have been implementing different electric tryouts of trucks in Berlin, in Paris. Uh, we have been working in developing new equipment to reduce our carbon footprint. We are working in a different initiatives as well to reduce our CO2 footprint and to uh, increase our productivity. And we have a long path to go together to in this journey. My expectations on Volvo are we need to go fast. 2030 is already tomorrow, we're late. We have one cycle left in our equipment replacement and we need to be bringing this new equipment into our business and our operations as fast as possible. We went together with Volvo to speed up this process. Uh, 2030 is just around the corner and we have together to lead this change and evolution towards a better world and to better solutions for our businesses. So we cannot have a Capital Markets Day without looking closer at one of our wonderful yellow machines, Melka. This one is actually quite famous. It was in media all over the world just a couple of weeks ago. You are absolutely right. And uh, what a beauty, don't you agree? I, it's fantastic. But, but why is it so special? To start with, this is the first construction machine ever built with fossil free steel going to a customer. And in this case, to our partner since long, NCC. And actually, they will start to use it in a quarry in the southern part of Sweden already this summer. So this is for real. Uh, secondly, the emissions from the material that we use in our products is a big part of our CO2 footprint. And steel is a big part of that. That's the reason why it's so important with fossil-free steel. And thirdly, to decarbonize the industry. I think it's so important with collaboration and collaboration in the whole value chain. And I think in this case, the partnership between SSAB, Volvo, and NCC, it's, it's a good example of that. And like Martin quite frequently points out, exactly. partnership yeah. is yeah. the new leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, during the last Capital, Capital Markets Day, you and I talked a lot about the uh, business opportunity with electric compact machines. And we really said that now we're going to create a new market with these. What has happened since? We made a lot of promises. Yeah. Yeah. So last, uh, last year we delivered the first fully battery electric com compact machine. So we moved from zero up to 321. And I must say that the demand for this kind of solution is accelerating. Not only on compact machines, but also on the bigger and larger ones. We listen to Semex, and uh, like Roger, you have a lot of customer that needs help on their decarbonization journey. And uh, you could hear it in the film as well. And it's, it's a strong demand from our customers. Smaller customers, but maybe even more on the bigger ones. We heard uh, Martin earlier here as well. And uh, already today, 50% of our key account global customers have already committed to the science-based targets. Semex is, is one of them. And when we talk to all of them, it's very clear that they need support in this journey. They need our support in this journey. And they need it now. They need it here and now. So we are investing quite heavily into our portfolio of both services and machines. And uh, by uh, 2030, we will have CO2-free alternatives for all our applications, actually. Uh, let's listen to two operators. They have both tried the new electric EC230. Take a look. Now I have tried out this machine for some time, the new EC230 electric. And uh, yeah, I just fell in love with it. The productivity, the efficiency, the quietness of the machine, because it's electric, it's really cool. And I think this will be very nice for me and my people working outside the machine on my working site. It's so quiet in the cab and outside the noise is kind of zero, so I can talk with my colleague without turning it off. And the productivity and efficiency is the same as my old diesel machine.
And these excavators, they will be introduced soon, both in Europe and in North America? The electric excavator EC230. What a fantastic <laughs> machine <laughs> it is. But it's, I think it's, uh, outside that, it's also a, a really growth opportunity for us because it's placed in the biggest and the most uh, fast growing segment within excavators, which is important. And my belief, if you, are, if you have a really good machine and if you're early out, that is a real first mover advantage. And uh, this is being tested in Norway now with great feedback. And uh, to your point, we will soon launch it in other markets in, in Europe and also in North America. But coming back also to, to what Joachim said, charging is very important in our industry. And uh, we are now developing a number of options, uh, mobile chargers, fixed chargers, uh, bigger power bank solutions. So we will introduce uh, uh, for all size classes, for all markets and for all different segments, different uh, uh, charging solutions as well. Mm -hmm. and the operators, they focus a lot on productivity, as we, can he we could hear in the movie, but productivity goes beyond the machine. Yeah, so we are not focusing on the machines only, of course, but uh, to offer complete solutions, so our customers can really optimize the whole working site. Of course, we will continue with traditional transactional machine and part sales, but focus more on the Volvo site solution. That means that the customers, they will buy productivity, the customers will buy uptime, and the customers will buy peace of mind. Mm. And actually, we have customers on all continents already today uh, using our equipment as a service uh, concept. Thank you so much, Melka, for describing your progress and thank you for bringing this wonderful machine. I'm sure we're going to see it more in media because there is a really high interest. Um, I need to get back into the studio. We are going to listen to our fifth business area, which is uh, Volvo Autonomous Solutions. And while I'm, on, while I'm on my way into the studio, I will show you a film that shows some of the segments where autonomy creates a great business opportunity. The challenges we face, it's about people, the climate, and our resources. At Volvo Autonomous Solutions, we see our vehicles as moving nodes in a network. And in this network, we want to be more than just suppliers. It's not an autonomous truck or machine. It is the autonomous transport solution, built on collaboration and our customers' needs. Through autonomy, we can transform how we create value, making it cleaner, safer, and more efficient. Our solutions address real-world problems, and the shift has already started. The dawn of autonomy is here, and Volvo Autonomous Solutions is proud to lead the way. The dawn of autonomy is most certainly here. Welcome, Niels. Thank you, Kina. Great to be here. Listen, a few years ago, Autonomous Solutions was really the talk of the town. It was in media more or less every week. We don't hear so much now, but I know that under the hood, things are really gearing up. And I would like you to show the audience how we are making progress. Absolutely. Thank you, Kina. Yes, a lot of progress we've made with Involve Autonomous Solutions. And let's look a little bit uh, under the hood. And Kina, as you know, within Volvo Autonomous Solutions, we've identified three strategic segments where we believe that autonomy can create the biggest value for our customers, but also for society. Let's look at those. The first one here, mining and quarry. Here we actively contribute to reduce the carbon two footprint on our customer side. And with automation, we're increasing, obviously, efficiency, but we're also adding safety as we're removing the human being from a hazardous environment. And we're doing this with a full stack solution. We've built our own virtual driver and we're connecting it with our truck and with our machine. Here you see the example of the Tara solution, which by the way, we're implementing as we speak with our first customer, Holcim. Let's go to the middle, middle the ports and logistics center segment. We know that certain ports in the world today are acting as bottlenecks. They're limiting trade, they're limiting transportation, but they're creating supply chain issues which impact many of us all around the world. We believe that more automation in ports and logistics centers will respond to that problem. 
And with our partner NVIDIA, we're working on autonomous solutions to help address that issue. That leaves me to the third segment, hub to hub, on highway transportation, geographical focuses on the US. We're developing an, auto an autonomous transport solution with our partner Aurora. And just in May, we've announced our first customer for the program, it's DHL. So let's hear from DHL why they chose to work with Volvo. We think Volvo is a tremendous partner for us in our autonomous trucking journey. We see autonomous trucking as a very strategic uh, opportunity here in North America. We all know that there are cost savings. We know that the long haul uh, driving is some of the least desirable here in the States. And we've had a trucking uh, truck driver shortage for many, many years before the pandemic. But one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about is the transit times. Our consumers are looking for faster and faster uh, receipt of the products that they order. And uh, we can move trucks across the US uh, several days faster uh, with, with uh, vehicles that don't need to take breaks, that don't need to rest. Vehicles that don't need to take breaks, vehicles that don't need to take rest time. And within Volvo, this is enabled through transportation as a service. And it means that we're expanding our scope. We're bringing new solution sales that will then unlock entire new revenue pools for the Volvo Group and giving us unprecedented access to the wider transportation industry. And the technology, the technology we deploy here is really at the core of our business, is at the core of what we do at Volvo. The next subject I want to talk about is our autonomous vehicle platform. And this autonomous vehicle platform is built using the Volvo CAS principles. CAS stands for Common Architecture and Shared Technology. My colleague Lars will speak more about it later. But for us, more precisely, this represents an autonomy-enabled vehicle and our own Volvo Virtual Driver Interface. So this interface, which we build in-house, an automation interface, communicates between the vehicle and the virtual driver. We can deploy this with our own virtual driver, which we develop in-house, but we can also deploy it with the virtual drivers of others, of partners. This allows a certain standardization, which is unique in the industry. But more important, this allows for scaling. We can scale across the Volvo Group brands. We can scale across geographies. But we can also scale across industry verticals, the use cases. But I also want to point out that this will strengthen Volvo's leadership position because we can allow tech companies to monetize their technology on our autonomous vehicle platform. Through this, we can also deploy new business models and enhance again the revenue opportunities for the Volvo Group. But at the core, at the core of all our autonomous solutions is our ambition that we want to support to solve real world problems. We want to respond to true needs we want to answer real demands, like the shortage of truck drivers, like the need for more safety, like the need for more sustainability. But we also want to respond to the quest of the always growing freight demand all around the world. Consequently, this strategy creates a great ability for us to contribute significantly to the Volvo Group top line, but also to the bottom line. And as visualized here, you can see that we think that the strongest opportunity we have is within hub to hub But again, it is within our approach of autonomous transport solutions where we can access new revenue pools. And by that, we can strengthen the growth and we can strengthen the resilience of the Volvo Group. The last thing for me today here is to announce that very soon we will open up our reservation program in the US for autonomous freight capacity. So more news coming soon. Back to you, Kina. Thank you so, Nils. Great to hear that we are soon opening up for orders and making history at the same time. That's the beauty. Thank you. Thank you. So having looked at our business areas, now we're going to dig a little bit deeper within our organization. Because to win this race, you also need to invest in product and solutions development and in production. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome, Lars. Welcome, Jens. You, you brought a lot of assets with you today. We have an enormous amount of assets in the Volvo Group, and it's truly a strength going forward in this transformation. Lars, I get a little worried. When mm -hmm. I look down at the cells, they look like my Nintendo batteries from the 80s. Yeah, or even like small uh, torch batteries. But I can assure you, Kina, that uh, from an energy perspective, um, they are completely outperforming your old Nintendo batteries. That's very comforting. Mm. Thank you so much. Jens, why don't you and I step aside and Lars walk us through and show our progress. On this transformation journey, there will be a lot of technology development. So being an engineer in our industry, it's just fantastic right now. We will add a lot of new and advanced technologies. So today, Jens and I, we will tell you about how we will continue to develop and produce our vehicles in an efficient way. 100% fossil free solutions from 2040 at the latest. We have stated before, we don't believe that there is one silver bullet. We believe that we need several technologies in parallel. For propulsion, we think that we need three technologies in parallel. The majority of our vehicles will be electric. They will be a mix of battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles. But we also believe that there will be, for some applications, a sweet spot for combustion engines also in the long run. We don't see an end date for the combustion engines, but then, of course, running on renewable fuels, like different kind of biofuels. And there is one, I call it a wild card here when it comes to combustion engine, and that is hydrogen. It is an area where we are gearing up our efforts, still early days, but so far we see really good and promising results here. I often get the question around this, the split between these three technologies towards 2040. And it's hard to predict if I only take the technical parameters into that equation. But I can tell you that it will not only be decided but, uh, by technology and technical parameters. It will also very much be defined by the availability and the cost of energy in different parts of the world be it green electricity, green hydrogen, or different kinds of biofuels. Depending on the energy production, distribution, and infrastructure, we will also see differences between countries and regions. And that means that in some cases, battery electric vehicles will be the sweet spot in one region. But for the same application in another region, then perhaps fuel cell electric or combustion engines on renewables will be the best solution. As chief technology officer of the company, I'm extremely happy that, uh, that we have the financial strength to work with these three technologies in parallel. Because with that, we feel that we can meet the future demands of our customers independently on what those demands will be. One contributor to our financial strength is definitely our cost system that Niels was into. Cost stands for common architecture and shared technology. We have many brands and we have many different vehicles in the Volvo Group, but uh, our 12,000 engineers, they have a cost mindset when they are developing components and systems. And that mindset is that my component or system I should always have the aim to be able to use it across the group, across all applications. By that, we can lower the development cost, we can get higher volumes, and we can streamline our production. We use cost in most areas. Niels talked about it when it comes to autonomous solutions. But today, I really would like to focus on our propulsion system. For combustion engines in the Volvo Group today, we have two engine families here. We have the family for the heavy duty applications and we also have one engine family for medium duty applications. They are used across the group in all business areas. Our automated manual transmission is used for all our truck brands across the globe and also in bus applications. And then we connect engines, transmissions, 
with a broad variety of different rear axles depending on the customer applications. And this is the complete traditional powertrain used more or less across the Volvo Group. Now, with electrification knocking at the door, we need to secure that we use cost also in this area. And uh, I would like to show you where we are on this. Here in the studio today, we have four components that are the base for the electric driveline for most of our vehicles for the future. So let me start with the batteries. Here you can see it's one, two, three of what we call our new cube batteries that we have developed together with our battery partner Samsung SDI. These batteries we will use in our heavy duty electric trucks that uh, for example Roger just showed you. Uh, but we will also use them in our yellow machines going forward. These battery packs are very modular and that means that depending on the customer specification we will use four packs or five packs or six packs onto a vehicle. Going forward, there will also be other geometries coming than battery pack geometries, but uh, from a cost perspective, reuse, we will use a, reuse a lot of technology and subcomponents into those batteries as well, as uh, battery monitoring system, thermal management, and charging systems. For fuel cell electric vehicles, then the fuel cell system is of course core. This is a system from Cellcentric, our joint venture together with Daimler. And inside this unit then, hydrogen is converted to electricity. And the power output of such a unit is 150 kilowatt. And in the heavy duty truck, we will then use two of these ones in order to get the right power output. Cellcentric as a company is then developing this right now. This is a prototype. Uh, the progress of the company is really good, both when it comes to uh, development of products, but also planning for high volume production. But developing fuel cell electric trucks is much more than just installing two of these ones into a vehicle. There is a lot of development, a lot of optimization in the area of thermal management and hydrogen storage to mention a few areas. And uh, a fuel cell vehicle is a fuel cell electric vehicle. So yes, there will be batteries on board on these vehicles as well with a little bit different requirements than what we just saw. But Reusing the cost philosophy, there will be a lot of similar technologies into those batteries as well. We have come pretty far when it comes to the development of fuel cell electric trucks. And uh, right now, we have vehicles rolling out at our test track outside of Gothenburg. So I dare to say that together with Cellcentric, we are on track to commercialize fuel cell electric trucks um, in the second half of this decade. The third component I would like to show you today is uh, this electric drive unit. This is the one that we will use in our heavy duty electric trucks. And uh, I want you to think like this, that we have replaced the combustion engine with one, two, three electrical motors. We are also here using um, an automated manual transmission. But this one is, of course, optimized for electric drive. Then we connect this unit with our full pallet of rear axles. We call this our versatile platform. It's very flexible and can meet a variety of customer demands when it comes to vehicle height, length, weight, number of axles. Tell me. With this solution, uh, we still install the driveline, the powertrain, in the center of the vehicle, in between the frame rails. That means that we have the batteries on the side of the vehicle, where we today have the fuel tanks. But for customers that have demand for even longer range going forward, then there is a true demand to get more energy on board on those vehicles. And that means that for those customers, for those demands, for those applications, we need something different. 
We need something uh, completely different. So ladies and gentlemen, and um, for the first time in public, and um, since the broadcasting is approximately two seconds delayed, you in the audience will be the very first one to uh, welcome the new child in the cast family. That, that was unrehearsed. So, uh, this is our proprietary electric axle or E-axle. So, here you see the rear axle. Uh, just imagine you have a wheel here, you have a wheel here. And then our engineers have installed the electrical motors, the electrical drives, and the complete transmission directly on to the rear axle. This is the complete driveline in one compact unit. And by that, we free up valuable volume, valuable space in between the frame rails. And uh, for better electric trucks, we will install more batteries there. For fuel cell electric trucks, we will install other components there. So our proprietary e-axle will be used for uh, better electric trucks with long range demands and in fuel cell electric trucks. Still in development phase, but within some years, this will be ready to offer our customers. So Kina, cost has taken us to where we are today and we intend to go on in the same direction on this journey also in the world of electric transport. Mm. And this last, if I may, is the definition of beauty. Yeah, I, I, dare, I dare to go that far to say that she's beautiful. She <laughs> Can I have one for Christmas? Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lars. As always, well done. Why don't you have a seat? And please join me, Jens. We're going to spot places. Um, during the last uh, CMD, we talked about um, how we are integrating the assembly of electric trucks into our existing assembly line. Yes. Where are we today? First of all, going very much from word to execution. And... Uh, but the message is still the same. Same platform, same plants. And we are leveraging on our existing knowledge on how to build high volume production with a very high degree of variance. And uh, that is really the key on how we can build electrical trucks on the same line as combustion engine vehicles. Why is this so important? Uh, for me, the main reason is scale. Scale to meet up when the S-curve is coming, segment by segment, Region by region, we need to be there with our industrial footprint and meet up wherever, whenever. How will we do this? It's really combining then. Uh, taking out a combustion engine component goes out, and instead we put in a battery electric component. And by that, we produce down the same line. We call it our mixed model assembly concept. And then you can ask yourself, when? Right here, right now, let's go to our assembly plant here in Gothenburg with Sandra, our plant manager. Here in Tuve, we're now producing fully electric, heavy-duty trucks on the very same line where we have producing trucks with combustion engines for years. In fact, mixed model assembly is not new for us. The electric drive line is only adding a dimension to an already existing fishbone concept. I'm standing by one of the pre-assembly stations that feeds the main line with from one side the combustion engines and the other side the MUT, the module under scab consisting of components for the electric engine. We fit the MUT at the same place in the truck as the diesel engine, at the same station on the assembly line, even using the same lifting tool. We've been producing trucks in Tuve for over 40 years. That experience and solid competence enable us to create production flexibility to meet the demands. If the customer wants it, we will build it. Now we're looking forward to volume ramp up in the autumn. We are ready. And as uh, Sandra pointed out, zero production in Tuve will start soon. Week 37. We are really excited. 
Uh, however, we should remember that already in 2019, we started cereal production in Blainville uh, for the medium product and in 2020 for our US platform. So uh, we are building both experience and competence. So we looked at truck assembly, but we are using the same modular strategy when it comes to powertrain. Absolutely. Let's have a look at the versatile platform that Lars talked about over there. Uh, we see the gearbox there, and of course it's optimized for battery electric vehicle. Uh, however, when we look at our industrial pro processes, we can reuse up to 90% of our industrial processes. So a good fit. If we go to the e-axle, uh, we can talk about that gearbox. Same thing here. We can reuse around 80% of our industrial process for that gearbox. And on top of that, see the axle in itself. It's costed in Skövde, and in Skövde today, we cost cylinder blocks and cylinder heads. So imagine in the future, when we do not cost a cylinder block, we will cost an axle instead. So uh, no stranded assets in powertrain. No stranded assets, good message for this audience. And like Lars said, uh, today we are buying uh, complete battery packs, but in the future our strategy will be slightly different and we will uh, deepen our own depth of engagement. Yes, but battery is a broad term. So, so how we build up a complete system? Uh, starting with a cell, going into a module, going into a pack and finally into an energy storage system. And when we now industrialize, we're a little bit going in the reverse direction. The energy storage system we have done since 2019, as I said earlier, in Blainville. We now start up our first pack high volume in Ghent 2022. We will, we will go into modules. We want to go into modules. Uh, and that is probably where we are at. If we look at the industrial logic, cells, that's chemistry. When we go to module, pack, and energy storage system, that's highly automated assembly, very, very good fit into our industrial system. And we'll do not forget the logistic part of it. So uh, to summarize, we have the competence and we have the platform, the footprint, and we are ready to meet the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jens, and we are already rolling. And just for this audience in particular, this is done without costs skyrocketing. They will not. Be very clear on that. Uh, we have to remember that we, from an operational perspective, we are not automotive. We are producing highly specialized industrial machines. It's our core business to handle variety. So no increased costs and uh, again, same plants, same platform. Thank you so much, Jens. Very clear. Um, dear audience, uh, you here in the room and also you online, of course, I hope that this has given you a good view of our progress and also a deeper understanding of the future growth journey that we have ahead of us. Uh, we will go even further in a minute, but first I would like to welcome back Martin, Tina and Jan. Uh, you have, of course, <coughs> been sitting listening carefully to all our colleagues. Martin, starting with you, your reflection. Now, but first and foremost, I think uh, the, the level of execution that is happening in the group uh, now as we speak, uh, technology, uh, the industrial development, the commercial development, I think it's fantastic to see how different things are coming together. Uh, and that's building on this uh, uh, customer centricity to really provide this uh, uh, tailor-made solution for our customers while leveraging in a small way uh, the platforms that we're having and at the same time adding a lot of uh, innovation and technology value. I'm, you know, I've always said this is the era of the engineers mm. and I, I get really, you know, excited to see it. And emotional, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, what about you? Yes, I think for me it was very <laughs> striking to listen to the, the what was presented by Roger and also by Emmanuel on the market shares. Uh, seeing that it was double market shares for Volvo trucks on the electric vehicles compared to ICE and the same with uh, Renault. Mm. I think that's a huge growth mm. potential for us uh, and it will be super exciting to see what this will take us in the future. Mm. And, and Jan, uh, we opened today by talking about how proud, proud we are of all our colleagues out there <laughs> contributing every day on this journey. And, and people, it's probably the most important investment we can do to do it in our own people. Yeah, exactly. I think, I mean, this is a transformation that fundamentally changes the industry and obviously fundamentally changes our company. And exactly as you said, I mean, to go back mm -hmm. where we started, Martin, with, with the people and the organization and all the competence that we have in the organization, I think it's just fantastic to see that during the course of the day. And obviously we meet a lot of more people yeah. than what you see here today, deeper down in the organization with a lot of competence. And competence that many people maybe thought 
were redundant in the transformation. It's not actually. Mm. So a lot of people that have competence that we can use still, and of course we can reskill a lot of people as well. So I, I think it's just great. And also to see the teamwork, how we will work along the value chain. I think we have seen a few good examples here as well. So uh, that's what strikes me actually. Mm. And what strikes me is that, I mean, I listen to you and listen to, to all my colleagues, we enjoy this transformation. It's great fun. We love it. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Martin, uh, in a second, I want you to move back mm. to the screen and also share with us why we believe that so strongly that the Volvo Group is the company to invest in. Please. Thank you. As a first and foremost, uh, I have to say, I mean, I've been listening into the rehearsal here uh, earlier this week and, of course, also listening into this every day. We are working 24-7 uh, with both the performance part of our company, but also the transformation that is actually now happening, but continue to uh, accelerating. Uh, but before coming into that, I have to say that I'm getting so excited about the energy uh, and the passion for this uh, uh, transformation and journey when I listen to my colleagues. And uh, knowing also uh, all the colleagues uh, in the group that they are representing, because that is the true value and the strength. And we have been doing a journey that is continuing now. A journey that has been based on a very, very clear and consistent uh, 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 focus when it comes to taking this company to the next level. Uh, we have been delivering on our financial ambitions and our strategic direction and we will continue to do so. We have seen how the underlying performance in terms of uh, financial outcome but also customer satisfaction has continued to increase. We have improved resilience and we have been very dedicated when it comes to our capital allocation in order to drive innovation, footprint presence and thereby also uh, customer uh, retention. Now we are continuing to invest into this transformation as a fantastic opportunity through new business models, as we have heard, but also when it comes to technologies and innovation. And that will be linked to an unprecedented opportunity for our industry and for our company when it comes to growth. But everything of that starts with the customer. And what you've heard here boiling down is that for the customer, it is about executing on three main parameters. It is the revenue and the TCO impact, the CO2 reduction, and the peace of mind, the ease of implementation and operation, giving the productivity outcome expected for our customers to in turn deliver to their customers. And this is a complex task. We should not refrain from the fact that this is a number of headlines. It is about executing on all these four areas when it comes to the vehicle with an application excellence and a tailor-made product for that specific use in that specific geography for that specific customers. And doing that also with scale and quality in order to provide a competitive solution. That is based on our core system. It is about repair and maintenance and productivity services packages with the right density when it comes to our network, when it comes to highly qualified people to support 24-7 around the clock where the customers are operating, and the financing and insuring solutions in order to get the complete act and solution together, providing all the way up to equipment and even transport as a service. And we have executed on the four very, very important piece, that is the battery systems, the charging infrastructure and solutions for our customers to bring that extra dimension with the first life of battery, the second life of battery, but also the recycling. Everything of this must in all details come together for our customers to make the shift into this. But the good news is that it's not stopping here. It's actually a very attractive case for all stakeholders in and around the Volvo Group. It is about attracting talents, it is about driving the motivation uh, among our colleagues, our partners in the value chain, but also for authorities and governments, and of course an investment profile for investors that want to have a solid performance here and now, but also great prospects for the future. This is based on a unique asset 
uh, set of assets that we, are, that we are lucky to have in the Volvo Group and that we are working hard to continue to develop. It starts with a long-lasting customer relation in a business where trust is everything in order to move ahead. And we have been building that for years and we are now seeing how we can continue to move along with together with our customers and also their customers. But it's based on the people, the culture and the value in our company. Combine them with a modular technology through the core system with a regionalized and flexible industrial footprint, bringing both scale and variation when it's needed to meet all these different S-curves. It's based on a global but still dense presence through our sales and service network to support 24-7. It's based on customer finance abilities that are continuously developed. And it's based on partnership with the best in the ecosystem in order to provide these holistic solutions where we are open up for uh, different type of partnerships and you've heard it already today, many examples. We are leveraging the multiple brands and their respective competitive set. And of course, at the core of this transformation also, the lead in technology, innovation and digitalization. When that is combined, we are getting to the current situation with a best in class profitability and yield, while at the same time maintaining a financial position for the future. A financial position that will meet different turmoils, but more importantly, to be offensive into this transformation and maneuver from a position of strength. That has brought us to high level of customer retention, leading market shares, and a resilience for this group redefined. But this set of assets will also lead us into the future, into the transformation. This is about a leadership in decarbonizing transport and infrastructure for the future, giving step change opportunities in market share, in service content, driving the business opportunities into solution as a service for even higher resilience, retention and recurring revenues and doing that in a capital efficient and flexible ramp up. Again, not leading the S-curves, creating them. And that takes us to the story of growth. Yes, we have had growth in our industry based on the underlying increase of demand of transport and infrastructure. That will continue to happen, but also through company-specific activities when it comes to market share gains step-by-step, step, uh, the service journey that we have talked about, and other factors as well. But now the transformation will lead us to another step when it comes to the growth opportunities. Based on the same factor, the underlying demand will continue to be there, more transport, more infrastructure, needs to be considerably more sustainable. We have ambitions for the company when it comes to continue to untap the service potential and of course to gain market shares in important regions where we already today have a strong position but can continue to grow. But the big step is of course when it comes to the transformation into electromobility, both fuel cell and battery electric. Here it is the 1.5x confirmed revenue over the life cycle that is the number one, but also when it comes to the first mover advantage, when it comes to market shares, but also service and finance uh, duration and penetration. And as cream of the pounding, as you have seen, uh, it will also uh, uh, give great opportunities when it comes to uh, infrastructure and energy services, when it comes to productivity services, built on our digital capabilities and the transport as a service uh, in selected segments with a great revenue pool potential. So this is the era of unprecedented growth opportunities. And for us, in order to summarize that, I can be clear about the opportunity for the Volvo Group. First and foremost, the industry dynamic and the company ambition we will capture this potential. We will continue to invest to win based on the set of assets that we are sitting on. We will continue to invest in technology, in innovation, in leadership, in presence, in people. And we will do that by continuing to deliver on our financial targets. 
That is the direction, that is the challenge, and that is the great opportunity. And the group has been into a journey that has been fantastic. That has, as you can see on this slide, led us to a situation where we have been increasing our customer satisfaction and we have been increasing our operating margin to a best-in-class level on, on or above 10% delivering on our financial targets. Now it's time for us to make the same journey when it comes to growth. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Stay put. Um, just to pause for a second here so all the messengers sink in. My humble reflection is that few companies actually have the prerequisites to manage the transition. I mean, I, I think we should be humble in this. There are a lot of investments ongoing, but what I feel and hope that everyone that has been here feels is that we have been consistent in our journey. Uh, when it comes to our execution and that we are seeing a great potential both when it comes to the company's prospects but also I have to say and admit that makes me very excited to uh, actually be part of uh, shaping the world that we want to live in. We know how important logistics, transportation and, and infrastructure uh, are for, for the development of a sustainable world and to at the same time being part of together with all great colleagues and partners uh, being able to deliver and develop the business and also shaping the world that we want to live in. I mean, how cool is that? Super cool. All right, Martin, thank you so much. We are going to change gear. But first, we have presented you with a lot of material today. And as always, it will be available on our global website, volvogroup.com. Now it is time to make room for all of you watching. We will finish today's uh, Capital Markets Day with the opportunity to ask uh, questions to our presenters. Stay put. So we are going to do this the following way. We have uh, several of you listening here in the studio and online who would like to ask questions to our presenters. We will take them one by one and it will be orchestrated by Krista and Johan from our Investor Relations Department. Krista, why don't you begin with the first question? Thank you very much, uh, Kina. And I think we'll limit to one question. And uh, with me, I have uh, Olof Sederholm. It's Olaf with ABG. Uh, so one question, but maybe a longer one then. Um, <laughs> it's, it's on growth, of course. Um, and 3% is your baseline. That's historical growth. Um, the illust illustrative example was looked good um, on the chart. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the... Uh, how quickly this growth can come through uh, in terms of realizing the uh, 1x times sales per truck. Um, is there a, uh, an immediate effect of that when you sell the truck or not? And also, um, a second part of my question, um, <laughs> is there a, a big difference in the growth opportunities you see in CE compared to trucks? Uh, shall I start and then you fill in, I mean, uh, John and Tina and anyone who, who would like to do it. Uh, I, I think, I mean, uh, first and foremost, I think we have been pretty clear about the number of uh, target settings here, uh, both when it comes to the revenue, revenues over the life cycle, also when it comes to the ambition of, of penetration. And I think you should think about uh, the, the figures you have seen, both from Roger and, and others here as a, a not of a hockey stick type of phenomenon. I mean, so everything should be realized 29, 30. So this will gradually come. Uh, what I think is good news to see here is that uh, we have now a pretty good momentum uh, when, when it comes to the acceleration of uh, uh, electromobility. That is based both on the demand from the customer side, but also based on the fact that we are getting better and better, uh, both when it comes to the product range, but also in our uh, sales uh, abilities and our sales uh, capacities, and also to offer the complete solution, as we have said. So this will gradually step in, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and when it comes to the immediate or not effect, that is to Emmanuel's point also depending on how different customers would like to see it. We will offer everything from a more traditional type of business with the products and the uh, added services up to the whole equipment as a service that by definition then will be more of recurring 
subscription type of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, revenues and thereby uh, obviously also another type of revenue recognition pattern. But, but uh, we have talked a lot about that. Uh, on one side you can say, okay, then in that case it will not immediately capture the growth potential. On the other side, it will make our industry even better when it comes to the recurring revenues and thereby the service content over the cycle and, and, uh, and uh, taking it out. Uh, generally speaking, I should say that uh, the dynamic that we see and maybe have seen even more and more, I don't know if you would like to add uh, Melker, but it has really catching up also uh, on, on the construction equipment side with the same type, both of solutions, but also on the interest from the customer side. Uh, so so um, uh, is it anything to add there, uh, Johan or Tina? No, I think the, the uh, maybe to think about the, the slide with the S-curves actually, because it kicks in gradually in different type of application, different markets and, and, and so on. And then there is also obviously an average on that one, but it will be different from, from application to application. And, and I mean, if you look at the Rogers order intake or, or in Noah, I mean, what used to be one year ago, uh, you know, uh, three, four trucks to test. First, it was one to two trucks to put in, uh, in front of the head office for customers. And then it was four to five trucks to start to test. Now we start to see the real orders coming in. I mean, uh, the performance team order to uh, Maersk uh, in, in Los Angeles or the DFDS order. I mean, there we are talking about uh, really electrify a complete hub or complete uh, terminal. So we see also the, the pattern when it comes to um, uh, the, the single order type of, uh, uh, of size. Good, thank you. Krista? Yes, I think next question we have uh, Agnieszka at uh, Nordea. Yes. Perfect. We, we talked a lot about the electrification, the potential coming from, from the technology changes for your group for the growth. Uh, but also part of your growth strategy is to improve your positions in China and in the US. So I wonder if you could reflect on your achievements there and also maybe if you could tell us if the COVID situation, the geopolitical situation changes your strategy for China. Yes, uh, and I can start and maybe Roger, you can also uh, add here, uh, both for North America and China. Um, what we have said is that obviously uh, good potential, a mature market, a part of it will come with uh, electrified uh, introductions here. As we see it, China is strong on that. We had a good offer also when it comes to these type of uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and also in North America, there are a number of different factors. We are running a big investment program now when it comes to uh, further extending the range for, for the two brands. Uh, and also actually strengthening our supply chain step by step. That has historically been one of the shortcomings that we have not been able to actually capture the full potential uh, due to the uh, supply chain uh, resilience, you can say, not only related to the situation that we have now, uh, but generally speaking, and, and that is a uh, work that is ongoing. But, but we have seen a positive development, Roger. I don't know if you would like to comment both uh, US and China. Yeah, I can do that, Martin. And uh, as we were into, we, we are seeing then a good growth into our development. And we are working, we have a good product offer both on diesel side, on electrical side in North America. We're taking market share in a good way, working with a comply, complete uh, regional value chain. But it's not only to take the market share, we are then taking profitable market share mm -hmm. as well with good price realization and good price increases that we're getting out. And also what that was into before that we have a leading position I into the electromobility that we are then the largest brand in North America and to manage this market. In China we have clear growth potential, we are building then the base of then our operation and to continue to grow our volume and to increase our business. So we are committed and to continue the journey in China. Thank you, Roger. Let's maybe. have another one from the room. Yes, mm. and uh, then we go to I don't Daniel. know, Kisle, if you want to... Maybe oh. to add on China and the geopolitical thing. I think it's important that we are also now building our industrial presence in China and that project is ongoing. Mm. But the way we build this is obviously that, that we build it China for China. We don't build it China for a bigger part and that's... I think maybe a little bit of a reflection that we think it is. But the market is huge. I mean, it is a one million truck market on, on average, even though this year is a little bit tougher. So we still have a belief in, in, in the Chinese market. And when it comes to the premium segments, we are sitting on a strong position. Uh, we have approximately 40% market share now for, for the Volvo trucks in, in those most advanced segments. And of course, these segments will continue to grow as logistics is continuing to mature also in China. 
Yeah, thank you. Then we move to you, Daniela Costa at uh, Goldman. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, has said uh, you gave a lot of details regarding EV, so I wanted to ask on autonomous. I think there was one number in the slide which was five times the revenue opportunity, um, but maybe I missed it in terms of timeline. I know you're launching this year. Uh, can you tell us through how you see the path, uh, if there is a 2030 target or some other sort of target like you gave for EV would be helpful? And also related to uh, autonomous, you mentioned hub to hub has the biggest opportunity in the US. I guess a lot of that is fleet. Can you talk about, give us a little bit more insight given, I guess you've been more skeptical on fleets in the US in the past. Absolutely, maybe Anis, if you would like to start. Yeah. You can stand up also so people see. Yeah. I think you know the timelines are different per segment, and with uh, what what I said earlier, uh, the segment uh, mining and quarry that's something which we're addressing now. We're starting with that. However, the biggest potential we see is in hub to hub, um, and here we have a clear focus on the U.S. market to start with. We of course also have thoughts that we will expand that outside of the U.S., but there is a lot to grab in the U.S., and we really believe that we need to be amongst the first out in order to really capture the growth potential there, and we're on a very good way. Now, there are different you know, dates out there uh, on when this will happen. We believe that it will start around the mid of this decade, but what will happen is not an overnight event. This is a gradual shift. This is a rollout which will actually take time. I think it will take several years that we will really be able to cover uh, the whole of the US as you have very different requirements in the, you know, Sunshine states versus if you go up into whatever the Midwest or even even above that where you, you have climate conditions which make autonomous driving more uh, more, more complicated or add to uh, to more complexity. But we believe there will be a start around the middle of this decade and then it will gradually uh, roll out over the rest of the decade. But I think, I mean, yes, to add to what Nils said, I mean, this is also uh, uh, where it's very clear that the business to business game is so important because also uh, for the first uh, applications, it will be dispatch areas and receiving areas. But the gain from a uh, uh, fr from uh, productivity, from a production solution, uptime perspective is so huge. So uh, you will have these uh, step by step solutions. For us, it's very crucial that we own the customer interface and all our efforts are gearing towards that and uh, the partnership which we have in place with Aurora gives us the customer interface. And we know from our customers that they really prefer to work with us versus uh, with other players which are new in the market. So the tradition we bring and the closeness uh, we have in place with our key customers is an asset which we can really leverage and we will utilize. Good, thank you. I think we are ready to move over to Johan and take our first question online. Yes, we have a question here come in, and, uh, which is saying that Volvo and Daimler is clear about the few cell vehicle need, but uh, some competition are leaning more towards uh, battery electric only. What's your reflection on that? Yeah, I mean, Joachim, you can f fill in here also. You have been studying this, uh, obviously, in the Volvo Energy space. I, I think you need to see this from a couple of dimensions. If you take the pure energy efficiency dimension, uh, then it's a clear benefit for a battery electric vehicle. And the reason for that is simple, as you understand. I mean, you have an electricity generation into a battery, and then you're dispatching that energy out to the powertrain, and you get a very high efficiency. So that is a no-brainer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to different type of applications, there are different needs to start with. When it comes to uh, autonomy, when it comes to flexibility, uh, when it comes to uh, how a, a network of uh, charging or fueling should be dimension. But then the big game is obviously when it comes to uh, the energy storage, the grid capacity, when it comes to the green generation of energy over time, where electricity instantly produced or storage will actually have a huge competition between different sectors. And we had a customers actually visiting the board uh, of AB Volvo, uh, a, a big Swedish customer, but very pragmatic, so it's a family-owned company. He got that question. Uh, how do you think about it? Uh, very progressive. They are running on bio-based uh, uh, solutions today with Volvo. And he said, you know, uh, I remember in the 60s in Sweden when we had one TV channel. Uh, uh, and uh, 
60 to 70 percent of the Swedish population were watching TV uh, when it was a popular TV show. And one of the popular TV shows was called uh, The Technical Magazine, Technist Magazine by Erik Bergsten. And one of these uh, TV shows, he was standing in front of the Stora Harsprånget Hydro Power Station, that is one of the biggest in Sweden, sending live. And he said to the audience that now I want all of you, the 60-70% of the Swedish population, to go out in the kitchen and turn all, on all your electric appliances. And then you go back and uh, look into the TV again. And then he said, we did see how the flaps of Stora Harsprång at Hydro Power Station slowly opened. And then he said, I realized one thing, and that is that electricity is produced when it's consumed. And we need to think about that in this transformation. And I think that is a brilliant answer. Why we will need to, rec uh, we, that we need to have the different type of solutions. So uh, uh, we are convinced that both will be needed. Uh, but we are also convinced that there are a lot of synergies, as Lars alluded to, based on the same electric powertrain, different energy storage, uh, great benefits for the customer. So, uh, Joachim, something to add on, <laughs> on that? <laughs> uh, it's difficult to compete with Stora Harsprånget, uh, for sure. But, but I, I think you said it well. I mean, electricity is consumed at the same time. It has to be produced and consumed at the same time. One of the greatest challenges when you look in the EV space in general, uh, you can look at the past car side, for instance, is getting enough electricity into the charging points because the grid is a bottleneck. And I think you hear, you hear politicians in different countries saying we've been basically harvesting the investments that were done in the 50s and the 60s, and we've been harvesting them for 50 years. So uh, to be honest, if we want to come together as a society and really meet the Paris Agreement, it's going to have to be a strategy of all of the above. Uh, and, and I think that's also why Lars uh, showed you very clearly the different technology strategies that we have, because it's going to happen that way. There is no alternative. But what is great about all this is, of course, this is taking both the technology cost system, but also our business model to a new level. Because what we anyhow need to develop, like uh, the fuel cell stack, uh, or the battery storage is for the truck, etc., can be utilized in a variety of different combinations. First life, second life. Uh, Helene and Volvo Penta, of course, will utilize that uh, for uh, different type of power generation activities. Uh, and it will be uh, also utilized for depot uh, support, for example, together with our charging system. So this is the cost system coming together on the next level. Great opportunities. Mm -hmm. Christer, I think we're ready for another question from the room. Thank you. And that is uh, Jose Azumendi. Uh, Thank you very much. Jose from JP Morgan. Just um, a question on, on battery and battery strategy. Can you comment on who are you going to be your key partners in terms of uh, battery sourcing? And also how far do you want to invest into battery packaging, battery modules? Um, and as we think about investment, I mean, fantastic presentation today around you know, how you want to think about all the different technologies. What does this mean for CapEx R&D for the company for the next five years? Is CapEx R&D going higher? Is it flat as percentage of sales? What does this mean for the group? Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Maybe start with uh, the partnership and how we think about it, uh, Lars and Jens, if you maybe a little bit. Our current uh, battery partner, as I said, is Samsung SDI. We are very happy with that partnership. Uh, I regard them to be top notch. Uh, and we have then developed uh, a number of batteries together. And we will continue to develop together with them. Uh, but it's also clear in our communication that going forward, there will be a lot of batteries. So we can simply not be only working with one partner. So there will be more partners on board in the upcoming years. Uh, and Jens, you were into it on your presentation already. Uh, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on this the cell module pack. Exactly. And, and when we are then potentially using different type of cell suppliers, we need to have the ownership of module pack and especially the software around it. Then we can be much more flexible. Yeah, then when it comes to CapEx, I don't know, Tina, yeah. if you would like to start. Yes, let's do a few comments on that. I mean, we are a bit different in the truck industry compared to the car industry. It's not so that we take one platform and, and exchange that to another one. But we will be able to have leverage on all the assets that we already have in the growth scenarios that we are looking into. And I think, Jens, you were stressing that quite well. 
I recall you said no stranded assets, <laughs> uh, which is good, uh, and we will leverage from the platforms uh, that we already have. Uh, then, of course, as we are growing, we will also investing, uh, and we will grow uh, significantly, as I think you dwelled a lot upon, uh, Martin, and the investments will follow. But we will also do that and still fulfill the financial targets. So that's the... The, the context. And, and I think that what Tina is saying is very important because we, <laughs> we were a little bit joking about uh, this uh, question yesterday. Not because it's a very relevant question, but we were joking about how to answer. You can do it in different ways. Uh, and, uh, and one way is, of course, uh, also to, to uh, refer to our own view on decentralization uh, with our different business areas. Uh, once upon a time, a couple of years ago, we were uh, cap based on every line on the PL. We said, okay, you have a cap on six uh, percent on R&D and uh, X percent on selling, etc. We found that uh, useless actually, a and say, okay, what we uh, expect from you is actually a delivery on your P&L completely, and actually to utilize the P&L and the full P&L over time. And I think that is also very much to Tina's point, coming back to what we see now. We have clear financial targets that we will continue to leverage. We will capture the growth potential, but we know and we should invest to win here with a return on capital employed of above 25% and the growth opportunities. I, I think it should be um, uh, passive to say that, I mean, there, yeah, there will be years with a little bit higher. It will not explode. Uh, but it will be smart, and, and that is a trust issue, I think, that we have been actually delivering over time here. But not taking the first mover advantages at this point in time should, I think, be unwise, uh, given the growth potential. Thank you very much. Krista? Yes, now we move to Harald uh, Hendrik Zett, Morgan Stanley. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the great presentation today. I can see you're very excited about <laughs> the new technologies and stuff. Um, can I just ask you, I, I, because I know you're very pragmatic and you think about this very deeply, um, from a societal perspective, right? we live in strange times. We've closed down a lot of nuclear power. We're burning more coal. Uh, and we're not really going in the right direction. If we think about the whole BEV shift, right? you can make the vehicle zero emission, and, and I, I have no doubt you'll be very successful in doing that. But w what about the lithium? What about the production of batteries? How do you control the supply chain? What about the infrastructure, right? We haven't even got enough power in the ground to be able to do high-speed charging in many places. How do you control the CO2 output in, in many of those ways, right? Because right now, the electric vehicles we're building, if anything, are bringing forward CO2 um, into the environment, right? And, and so I, I know this isn't necessarily a Volvo question, but it is a wider question that needs to be addressed. And, you know, do you see that becoming a roadblock for you or have you got a, a good answer for me again? I mean, if I start and anyone can fill in here, but, but uh, this is a true challenge, obviously. Uh, and if we were to be serious that the end game here is to make the planet a better place, uh, which is the end game and it must be the end game. I mean, uh, we see that the planetary boundaries cannot cope with the current development. So uh, in that regard, we need not only to look upon, so to speak, our part of the value chain that we are providing a battery electric and we say, OK, we cannot help that uh, it is uh, powered by uh, brown electricity, for example. So we are both thinking and investing a lot in this. We think that one of the key aspects when it comes to our joint ventures in Volvo Energy, for example, is not only to take this together with Daimler and Trayton, but to also uh, um, link in other partners that see the pathway on heavy trucking now, on battery and also fuel cell electric, and thereby thinking with the uh, utility and energy companies, how do we make sure that we are thinking both when it comes to the big build-outs uh, of nuclear and hydro, Stora Harsprong <laughs> type of projects, uh, but also when it comes to the decentralized power and how do we leverage that in the sm smartest way. When we talk to the big windmill uh, producers that are also going more into the solution, they say, I mean, 60, 65% is utilized efficiently. The rest cannot be utilized because then you're, you don't have the anywhere to put the electricity because it's produced and consumed at the same time. A and here, obviously, with the assets that we are sitting on, battery storage, uh, hydrogen production, etc., we can gradually build it out. Then we have been clear about one thing. We should not utilize... The, the possible roadblocks in other parts of not doing our part. But then we should try to actually participate on how can we be clear about our transformation together with our customers to support others to do their part because some of the big investments need also visibility, what are the technologies to be used. Uh, but in the short run, uh, this is of course uh, one of the key 
areas to think about. I mean, we should not uh, avoid to discuss the fact that we are seeing an integrated type of world move into a fragmented, uh, a free trade world move into a, a industrial policy based type of landscape where, by the way, the regional value chains and the cost system will serve as well, but also from a deflationary to an inflationary environment based on these premiums that will come into society when it comes to health, defense, uh, resilience, uh, green transition, energy transition, etc. And my fear is that at the end of the day that we will start to take out the most important part of the equation that is actually the green transition. And here we really need to keep an eye on now that we are continuing to invest in the energy transition that will actually support the green transition. Then when it comes to batteries, very good, uh, or the materials, very, very also very important question is of course that one thing that we have learned during the uh, crisis uh, recently is the relation with our supply chain partners. Uh, semiconductors being one of them, it's not only the T1, is the T2, T3, T4, T5. <laughs> uh, it's 2,000 semiconductors in one truck, just to have a, a figure. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, we have strengthened the relation up in the value chain here. And that goes also for uh, the materials now for the future. So we have great contracts uh, and con contacts and contracts with mining operators, refiners, etc. And to try to construct also this pathway, because at the end of the day, uh, it must be a fossil-free product and solution. Otherwise, it's, uh, we have not done our job, so to speak. Thank you, Martin. Another one from the room, Krista. Yeah, thank you. We have a question coming from there. Hi, yeah, Tom and Ryan, RBC. Thanks for taking the question. Um, on battery raw materials, just to follow up to what you were speaking about, um, curious as to how chemistry helps solve this problem and also Recycling could recycling be the silver bullet? And we've all seen what happened with semiconductors. Everyone's doing their math now on nickel and cobalt and and everything. You know, how how do you see those two uh, chemistry and recycling as potentially solving this issue? And if we just a quick follow up on the um, hub to hub, is that by mid decade without a driver completely? Thanks. So if we start uh, with uh, uh, materials and the, the recycling aspect. So chemistry, yes, working on different chemistries uh, with a clear ambition then to reduce the use of, um, let's say, the more precious ones and the more scarce ones. Uh, recycling is extremely interesting and uh, today both research and industrialization, uh, is industrialization is pointing into the direction that it will be possible more or less to recycle all material in a battery. So we should think like you produce the battery once and then you recycle it. You hear more and more about the urban mines, companies investing into the recycling uh, uh, flow here. So that must be part of this, definitely. And that's, the, that's a part of our value chain that we are working on. And Joachim, maybe if you would like to add, how do we think about these different steps uh, when it comes to our own processes? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and <coughs> as if you remember the slide I showed with the circle, it's circular and that of course includes recycling. So we will have the first life usage, then we will as much as possible also try to have a second life usage because then we postpone the recycling for another decade or so and leverage that asset value. Then of course we will also do the recycling when the time comes. That is the, the basic intention that we have then, right? So to extract the value, and that's good for, as I said, both for the planet and also for business then, right? So it's good for all stakeholders. And Nils, uh, on uh, the virtual driver, will it only be the virtual driver in, in, the, in the truck? Yeah, of course, the objective is to, to remove the safety driver. I don't know where, where the question came from. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, doing the right things, saying, you know, this is, will exactly happen on, uh, on that date. But I think the industry forecast is the, is the middle of, uh, of the decade. And the industry, but also Volvo, we're working very hard towards that. Uh, we're making significant progress, but we also know there are still things we need to solve, things we need to address, things we need to verify, things we need to validate. But we have a clear ambition and, uh, you know, we have, you know, drawn, you know, for ourselves, of course, the things we want to accomplish by a certain point uh, in time. And uh, everything, you know, what we do, what the industry is doing is moving towards mm -hmm. this, uh, this time frame, which, uh, you know, I've indicated. Very good. Krista, one more. Yes. Uh, we have Björn at the Danske Bank. 
Thank you. Yes, uh, on uh, your current journey or transformation, uh, and how much is Dongfeng contributing, or how much are you benefiting from them, or would you say that the business case no. for that JV has uh, uh, changed last, what is it, uh, 10 years or so? No, I think we, um, when it comes to Dongfeng, obviously we, we are working with the pre uh, present business model when it comes to the IC and so on, and, uh, but we are obviously also evaluating uh, the oppor opportunities when it comes to the transformation as well, but it's still on that topic too, uh, too early days, actually. Christo, I think we have reached our last question. Okay, yes, then we have, uh, going over to SEB, Erik Orang. Thank you. Uh, you, you. You're pushing the message of higher growth pretty strongly here today, and, and you seem very confident in it, but, but there's no new target to back it. Why not? To complement the margin target. Now, I mean, uh, what we have said here is, of course, that I mean, there is a clear growth opportunity. Uh, we have also outlined what are the different parts. Uh, what we have said is also we think it is important to be credible. We think that we have built our journey on credibility, on delivering on what we are saying. And since some of these uh, aspects are pretty early out now, uh, we have said that indicate that this is an era of uh, unprecedented growth when it comes to the content of the different type of solutions instead of just the, the unit count, if I put it like that. But uh, so far decided to keep the financial targets and indicate that the, the next step in this journey now will be to uh, do the same type of journey when it comes to growth here. But again, I mean, uh, as, as we said, Eric, also, uh, if you look into the different metrics and, uh, and I think you can also shape a, uh, 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 an interesting picture about the opportunities. Very good. Thank you. And thank you for putting good questions to our presenters. We have, in fact, reached the end of this year's Capital Markets Day. As I said before, all materials are available online and in various social media channels. And the last thing for me to say is, Martin, why don't you do the closing? Thank you, Kina. And uh, I will be very brief. Uh, I would like to start by saying thank you to you, Kina, also for uh, leading us through this uh, Capital Markets Day. It is a task in itself with all the things that are cooking in, in the group and uh, around us also with the customers and suppliers, etc. I will keep it short. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you everyone that has been coming here today. Thanks for interaction and coming interaction also during the afternoon and also to all of you listening in to the web uh, for uh, questions. And of course, we are the whole team available for further discussions in interactions. Uh, and as just a very uh, final closing, I hope that you have felt that my team, myself and the whole Volvo Group, all colleagues around the world together with our partners, we are really excited to move into the future. <laughs>